Good morning and welcome to worship on this first Sunday after Easter. When it was evening on that first day of the week, Jesus came and stood amongst his friends and said, Peace be with you. On this first day of this week, with our celebrations of Easter a week behind us, we rejoice that still Christ is risen and meets us here. Let us worship him. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we have heard the good news. Jesus is risen. This morning, help us to linger in that hope and realise that this is not last week's old news, but today's good news, fresh news for every day. As your early disciples gathered each Sunday because that was the day you rose, so may we find resurrection hope as easily in this day as last week. Like Thomas, it's easier for us to doubt than to accept. We forget those moments when your presence has truly touched our lives, when your love has overwhelmed us, when the realisation of what you've done for us has struck hard and left us joyful. How easy it is to forget those moments. Forgive us and help us to know that in the seeking of forgiveness, everything is wiped away and we are free to start afresh with you as though our faith is brand new. Give us courage as we worship you today to open ourselves to the fact of your resurrection and the possibility of allowing you to live in and through us. They make, we make this and all our prayers in the name and for the sake of Jesus who taught us to pray and to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
hear the word of God. Our first reading comes from John's first letter. 1 John chapter 1 verse 1 to chapter 2 verse 2. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we've seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and don't live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so you won't sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And then in John's Gospel, John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors closed for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Just like dew on mountain tops, they freshen all the earth. How good it is when God's will is done. Sisters and brothers living as one. When we live in unity as God's beloved people, God bestows his blessing giving life forevermore. How good it is when God's will is done, sisters and brothers living as one. The old man lived near Ephesus. He'd been there a good number of years since leaving Jerusalem in company with Mary, his closest friend's mother. All those years ago, his friend had asked him to look after his mother Mary when he knew he was dying. And the man had never failed in that duty. So wherever his work had taken him, Mary had travelled too. But now she was gone and he was on his own. Well, not really because even now he was working, some 50 years later, and now his work was written, recording his memories of time past and trying to help folk make sense of it for their own lives in the here and now. John was the man's name. Some called him John the Apostle. Others, John the son of Zebedee and the brother of James. Some, the beloved disciple. But since the death of his beloved master Jesus all those decades ago, John had dedicated himself to spreading the good news about the man who had died and risen again. It worked with Peter and with Paul and with many others. In recent years, his work had been mainly in the growing churches around Ephesus. But now he's a wee bit troubled because he's hearing some very strange things about what these churches and their people are beginning to believe. There were a number of folk going around corrupting the gospel, making it suit their own ends, encouraging people to follow them instead of Jesus. It was all very disturbing. So John, who had spent some years recording his recollection of life with Jesus, now took to writing letters to the nearby churches, explaining that all these false teachers were leading them astray, that they shouldn't believe him them. And to do that, he reminded them of the most reliable accounts of Christianity. That Those were the ones from the folk who'd been there. And John said, I was there. How many memories must have come flooding back as John wrote to those people who were so confused. That day out fishing as usual with his father Zebedee and his brother James when a stranger came along and just invited him to follow. Why did he follow? Well, there was just something compelling about that man, Jesus, that led him and James to want to go and their father encouraging them to leave him and do so. There were special moments when Jesus took only a few people with him and John was always one of them. Up the mountain for that incredible moment of transfiguration into quiet places. There were times when John got it badly wrong, when he chased people away from Jesus because he didn't think they were good enough, when he challenged Jesus and refused to believe him, when he and his brother wanted to know that they were more important than anyone else. Oh, those weren't comfortable memories, but they were memories that helped John as he penned those words to the churches to help them understand what was true. For those were recollections that reminded him how easy it is to get the wrong end of the stick. He recalled the night before Jesus died and those special moments together 
he would never forget his arrest and trial and then the crucifixion. It was hard to go to that dark place outside the city and witness what they did to Jesus, but he plucked up the courage. And it was there that Jesus paid him the best compliment he could. He might not have been willing to say that John was the greatest, but he did entrust his mother to his care. He remembered taking Mary back to the house where they were all staying, and there they all remained grief-struck, speechless and shattered. It was hard to let Mary leave that safe place on the third day after Jesus' death, but she wanted to go to the tomb and tend her son's body. The other women told him they would look after her, but when they came back with a far-fetched story that Jesus' body wasn't there, he and Peter knew they had to take charge and go and re reassure them that it was. But it wasn't there. That evening, they suddenly discovered why. Jesus had risen from the dead, and as he came among them and allowed them all to reach out and touch him, John remembered that that was what he'd promised. He was alive, sin defeated, death conquered. And in that moment, John knew that his life's work was to share the absolute wonder and blessing of a risen saviour. So now the old man sat, penning his words of encouragement. Trust me, he said, I was there. This is truly what happened. He wanted them to tell them, knowing that it was far better than anything those false teachers could come up with. And then his confidence faltered as he remembered one of his last encounters with Jesus before he ascended to heaven. The disciples were living still in that small cramped house, still wary, still uncertain what to do. And that night, Thomas, who'd been missing when Jesus had come to them the first time, was there. And as his friends spoke excitedly about the visit of their saviour, Thomas shook his head disbelievingly. Sorry, I can't believe that. Not until I see it for myself. Well, I don't need to tell you what happened next, do I? But it transformed Thomas. It's always better, isn't it, to experience things for ourselves. Thomas knew that, and so did John. But John had to trust that sharing his own eyewitness account would be the next best thing for those who couldn't see it for themselves. And we know that it was. For how many people through the centuries have discovered for themselves that the Easter story and all that preceded it isn't a fantasy that makes them feel better but in fact the most significant event in history, with the potential to change lives in every generation. We tend to see, we tend to say we will believe it when we see it. But what John wanted his readers to know was that that isn't what happens when it comes to the things of God. Rather, in matters of faith, we should have great expectations that when we believe it, we will see it. What does that mean? Well, it means viewing our lives through the lens of faith, not logic, not common sense, not make-believe, but faith, of recognising there are things that are possible beyond our imagination, our understanding or our experience. The other day I had a video call from young Reuben. He called because he had a question that he told he was told needed my answer. Who made God? he asked. I hate those kind of questions. Because to answer them requires suspending logic, something all human beings struggle with. I thought for a moment and I said to him, Reuben, no one made God. He just happened because he's the start of everything. And thankfully that seemed to satisfy Reuben but I'm pretty sure we'll return to the question at a later date. But it is a difficult question, isn't it? Requiring us to hold on to faith that we don't need to understand everything for it to be true. That's what those folk in the early churches were struggling with. They were hearing folk who were trying to make faith explicable in terms they could understand, but in doing so, they were perverting it. John said, listen to me, 
I have seen this for myself. I was a witness and now I bear witness to you. We might not be able to describe our encounters with Jesus in such a vivid way as John was able, but as Christians, we're asked to be confident that as he's promised, he's with us because he's not dead, he's alive. And when we are certain that that's true, even though we might never be able to prove it in rational terms, then we too can bear witness. If we will only believe it, then we will see it. Let us pray. Lord, in the darkness, you broke out and brought us life beyond all possibility. As we respond to that, we bring our gifts to you and they seem inadequate but sometimes they feel like all we can offer. May we know that when we offer all that we can with open hearts, you receive them with joy. Amen.
Let us pray. Longing for light, we wait in darkness, O oh God. So many times that has been the experience of your people and every time the light has shone as surely as the sun rises to greet a new day. Each time light has pierced the darkness and overwhelmed it. In this new day, we've woken once more to light breaking through, just as those women did on that first Easter morning. For them that day, it seemed as though even daylight could not have improved the gloom that had settled, the grief that had overtaken their lives, leaving no room for joy, the pain that felt beyond healing, the defeat that seemed beyond hope. And yet in a moment, Lord, you changed all that as you rose, bringing light that couldn't be extinguished. Cast that light, O Lord, into the lives of your people. Whatever cast the shadows, may your gentle presence offer the possibility of light. To the sick, grant healing. To the dying, peace. To the bereaved, comfort. To the helpless victims of humanity's cruelty and to those whose difficulties are self-inflicted alike, offer hope. To those struggling to make their way in the world, light their path and reach out your hand to lead those who have given up. Sometimes, O oh Lord, it's easier to sit in the shadows. Draw us into the healing, restoring light that is your presence. Gather us in with all whom you love and all whom we love, that together may we, we may learn to light the world. Amen. Now go in peace, to love and to serve the Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, 
Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with you now and always.